Hello, and welcome to the audio component of Out of My Mind's Eye. I am Susan Demeter St. Clair, and this recording is part of an ongoing series that, in part, features my research into exceptional human experiences. This episode of Out of My Mind's Eye takes a fresh look at the infamous Morton case of Cheltenham, England, also known in paranormal circles as the woman in black. Apparitions and haunting experiences, including all the associated phenomena that fall under the umbrella of the word ghost, have been reported since the earliest time of recorded human history. People relating first-hand accounts with ghosts represent every country, every culture, all major religions, socioeconomic circumstances, educational backgrounds, and ages. And while belief in ghosts has never been considered fully respectable in general society, All attempts by both religious and natural scientific philosophies to give an explanation to the phenomena have failed to either dissuade popular interest in the subject or to disrupt the phenomena from occurring and being reported. Experiences with ghosts, ghost stories, and myths of hauntings have been occurring without break or end throughout known human history. The overwhelming anecdotal evidence points to the reality of the existence of the phenomena called ghosts. It is what the ghost and the haunting experience actually is that is still very much hotly debated. While there have been many theories and opinions on what ghosts are, from the natural to the psi-based, There is little consensus among scholars and even the public in general on the true origin or nature of the ghostly experience. The most popular notion of what a ghost may be is the belief that it is representative of a deceased person's personality. We can call this the DPH or the dead person hypothesis and much like the ETH which is the extraterrestrial hypothesis with UFO experiences, it is firmly entrenched as the popular paranormal belief and very much supported throughout Western culture. Now both the DPH and the ETH may have their merit. In fact, they may even be the true cause of their respective events. No one can say with 100% certainty However, neither of these hypotheses have brought us any closer to an understanding of these strange and mysterious happenings. Now, while I do not pretend to have any firm answers, I do propose that we think outside of the box, so to speak. And with this recording, I will attempt to have a different, perhaps maybe a fresher look at the infamous Morton case of Cheltenham, England. In other words, the famous woman in black. And this would be in the hopes that at the very least, uh, I may be able to spur some discussion and some new thinking outside of the box. For those who may be unfamiliar, this is one of the best documented hauntings on record. And I feel it is important here to give you the listener a good background of this case before I put forward my thoughts on its possible true nature. The Morton case, 
from Cheltenham, England, is so named by the Society of Psychical Research after the pseudonym chosen to protect the witnesses at the time it was first reported. The haunting was initially documented by a 19-year-old medical student named Rosina Clara Despard, and it involved her own family. Rosina chose to report the case under the pseudonym Miss R.C. Morton in order to protect her family's privacy at the time her reports were made to the Society for Psychical Research. Rosina documented several eyewitness accounts that later received independent verification from SPR, SPR founder uh, Frederick W. H. Myers. From approximately 1882 to 1889, Rosina and several members of her family repeatedly saw the apparition of a woman which would wander through their home. I'm going to give you now a first-hand account in Rosina's own words. The figure was that of a tall lady, dressed in black, of a soft woolen material. Judging from the slight sound and moving, the face was hidden in a handkerchief, held in the right hand. This is all I noticed then. But on further occasions, when I was able to observe her more closely, I saw the upper part of the left side of a forehead and a little of the hair above. Her left hand was nearly hidden by her sleeve and a fold of her dress. As she held it down, a portion of a widow's cuff was visible on both wrists, so that the whole impression was that of a lady in a widow's weeds. There was no cap on the head, but a general effect of a blackness that suggested a bonnet with a long veil or a hood. The specific and repetitive pattern of the path the apparition took is also noteworthy. The path began on the second floor of the house near Rosina's bedroom, usually at a time when she would hear the sound of someone pushing against her bedroom door. Upon opening it, she would see the ghostly widow walking down the hallway towards the stairs. The figure would then descend all the way down to the ground floor and enter the front drawing room, where it would sit or stand for a brief period of time at a bow-shaped window located at the far side of the room. Then it would exit the room and head for a narrow passage leading out to the garden where it would regularly vanish. In 1983, parapsychologist William Roll noted that apparitions experienced in haunted locations tended to display a repetitive pattern within the location. Apparitional experiences, especially of the repetitive haunting type, tend to be associated with a special area, he noted. In both the cases, Roll had investigated of a haunted radio station and in the Morton case, the apparition followed a specific pattern in the hallway or a special area of each respective building. Hallways and staircases often feature in haunted houses as locations of the appearance of apparitions and I will be expanding a little bit more on this shortly. Rosina had seen the apparition about six times between 1882 and 1884. She told no one in her family about her experiences and during the same time frame at least three other people in the house saw this apparition. At first the ghost looked so solid to the other people seeing her that she was often mistaken for a real person. And I will tell you an account uh, that was documented that will illustrate this. In the summer of 1882, the widow appeared to my sister, Mrs. K, when the figure was thought to be a sister of mercy who had called at the house and no further curiosity was aroused. 
She was coming down the stairs rather late for dinner at 6.30, it being then quite light, when she saw the figure cross the hall in front of her and pass into a drawing room. She then asked the rest of us already seated at dinner, who was that sister of mercy whom I have thought I'd just seen going into the drawing room? She was told there was no such person, and a servant was sent to look, but the drawing room was empty, and she was sure that no one had come in. Mrs. K persisted that she had seen a tall figure in black with some white about it, but nothing further was thought of the matter. Rosina's younger brother and another little boy also saw the apparition while they were playing outside on the terrace one afternoon in December of 1883. They both looked into the bow window of the drawing room at the same time and saw the apparition standing there and appearing to cry. Both ran inside to see who the lady was who was crying in their window and they found no one there. The maid had told them that no one had come into the house. The following encounter is of interest as it illustrates a common element also found in other hauntings. I went into the drawing room, said Rosina, where my father and sisters were sitting, about nine in the evening, and I sat down on the couch close to the bow window. A few minutes after, as I sat reading, I saw the figure come in at the open door, cross the room, and take up a position close behind the couch where I was. I was astonished that no one else in the room seemed to see her, as she was so very distinct to me. My youngest brother, who had before seen her, was not in the room. She stood behind the couch for about a half an hour, and then as usual, she walked to the door. Rosina was apparently the only one out of several people in the room that night to see the apparition. Now this could be suggestive of an ESP or extrasensory perception component to the haunting. And it should be noted that not all the people living in the house at the time saw the apparition or experienced any other haunting phenomenon. Rosina's father and stepmother did not experience the apparition at all during this period. All sorts of attempts were made by Rosina to test the physicality and capture evidence of the apparition. Rosina tied strings across the path the apparition would take and would at least in one instance attempt to tackle the ghost in order to touch it. These, along with an attempt to photograph the apparition, yielded very little results. Rosina also tried to talk to the apparition and communicate with it using various symbols. In Rosina's own words again, I opened the drawing room door softly and went in standing just by it. She, the ghost, came in past me and walked to the sofa and stood still there. So I went up to her and asked her if I could help her. She moved and I thought she was going to speak, but she only gave a little gasp and moved towards the door. Just by the door, I spoke to her again, but she seemed as if she were quite unable to speak. This, to me, seems to indicate some awareness on the part of this apparition. Other haunting phenomena experienced in the house included sounds of footsteps, temperature fluctuations or cold spots and icy breezes felt by the witnesses in the presence of the apparition or ghost. Although Rosina did note that the candles in the rooms would never blow out, despite these cold, strange breezes. The apparition appeared solid and very lifelike in the beginning of the haunting, but it seemed to gradually fade over time, and by 1889, it had vanished completely. Inquiries made by the Despard family revealed that the apparition resembled an Imogen Swinhoe. 
the second wife of a previous occupant of the house. It should be noted that the woman most strongly suspected to be the cause of the apparition did not die in the house. The family eventually moved out of the house and Rosina went on to become a physician of forensic medicine. Very few cases of a haunted location have been so well documented, as well as debated, as the Morton case. The early haunting experience demonstrates instances of collective apparitional experience, a possible example of a retained place memory in the form of a reoccurring apparition, which may have shown a minor degree of awareness and an extrasensory perception component to the ghost's appearance, and potentially suggestions of immateriality in the appearance of the apparition's figure, despite the fact that it looked solid in form. And again, I will recall to you how uh, Rosina at one time actually tried to tackle this apparition, which to her appeared as a solid person, a solid woman, uh, walking through the hallway. And yet when she tried to tackle her, like a football tackle, I suppose, uh, she, she didn't touch anything. She didn't make any contact with anything solid. So that in itself is quite telling as to perhaps the true nature of the, uh, the ghost, despite its, its solid appearance. Throughout later decades, the house changed hands a number of times, and it is currently still in use. It has most recently been divided into apartment flats, and while the phenomena seems to have gradually stopped for the Depard family, it continued on with newer generations of witnesses of varying backgrounds right up until the 1990s. Later witnesses described the ghost as occasionally being outside of the house. And surprisingly, the apparition has also been reported to have appeared in other buildings in Chuntelham that would have been around in the time period of the first haunting. The figure of a woman resembling the ghost of St. Anne's was first seen in 1958 and 1961 in the Cotswold Lodge, a building which has now been demolished, which stood on the opposite side of the road from St. Anne's and within sight of it. I should mention at this time that St. Anne's uh, was later named um, uh, the house that, that uh, the Mortons had lived in, or the Despard family had lived in. The following is an example that I'm going to give you of a haunting in the old Despard family home, which then became known as St. Anne's. And this was uh, nearly eight decades after the original haunting, so 80 years later. In the autumn of 1969, I stayed at St. Anne's with a number of clergy for a residential weekend. It is important to state I had not heard of St. Anne's reputation and therefore I had no expectations. Having said evening song, the clergy decided to visit a local hotel for a drink. Feeling the onset of a heavy cold, I decided to stay in and have an early night helping myself to tea downstairs and taking two aspirin tablets. It was our custom to mark our own beds to help the staff of St. Anne's. As I made my bed very carefully, it was not very warm in, the, in my own bedroom and I retired. I fell asleep quickly. I woke to the strange sound and sensation of fingers scratching the eater down across the back of my neck and I thought it must be a silly practical joke by some other man who had come into my bedroom leaving the others outside. So I sat up suddenly to catch the man in the act as it were only to find no one by my bed. The room felt bitterly cold when to my amazement the bedclothes which I had carefully tucked in myself seemed to be pulled slowly from me onto the floor of the foot of the bed. 
I had said the office of the evening song in the chapel, and my prayer book was still open at the page by my bedside. The room was quite light without the bedside lamp. Quickly I repeated, Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and thy, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of the night. As I said the words, a great shape took form by the door and came at me slowly passing over my head and through the wall on my left shoulder. I put on the light and searched in the landing staircase and house. I was alone. No one had returned from the hotel and it was still only about 10.45. I remade the bed and returned to sleep, thinking my cold was worse and that I had experienced a very bad dream and caused my own bedding to slip up by my own movements. Perhaps the gray figure was a trick of the moonlight and my cold feelings, my slight temperature and even fear. I decided to say nothing. In 1970, when I was at Wells Theological College, a discussion one evening turned to a great surprise when someone, a member of the Society for Psychical Research, began to describe experiences at St. Anne's House, Cheltenham. It seems that I was not alone. So I described the above incident. I learned that another clergyman, who has since died, had had an almost identical experience to mine, and that I had slept in the principal bedroom, and the wall through which the gray shape had passed led to what had been a dressing room of the original house. Changes to the structure had been made when it became a retreat house, and a doorway from one room to the other was blocked by a partition wall. This account by the clergyman, whose name I am withholding, is of great interest. It is notable that this later experience included poltergeist-type phenomena. Um, in other words, the uh, removal of the bedclothes, uh, which was missing from the list of happenings in the house during the occupancy of the disbarred family in the 1880s. So this was definitely something, something new in this later haunting. St. Anne's was closed as a diocesan house on December 31st, 1970, and in 1973 was bought by a housing association for conversion into flats. The first tenants, a taxi driver and his wife, took the second floor flat that contained Rosina's old bedroom, and that was also the same area where the clergyman had had his experience. Uh, so this was from where Rosina first saw the apparition of the woman in black. The couple soon began to experience haunting phenomena. And these later events were also very well documented. So what really happened? Who or what is the woman in black? I believe we should focus our attention on the very first witness. It is the experience in any paranormal event that can be considered the one truly tangible component of any given case. And I often repeat that, including uh, with the cases that I deal with that are involving UFOs or even cryptids. Whatever is occurring, the one thing we can all agree on is it is a human or living experience that is being reported. In this case, witness zero is the young medical student, Rosina Despard. Who was she? What was going on in her life and in a greater general context of the world in which she lived in? Apparitions and other haunting phenomena by their very nature and popular definition um, can be defined as liminal. The term liminality has its origins in anthropology 
and is referring to the borders of and spaces between categories. Uh, limen in, in Latin means uh, threshold, and anthropologists have become interested in a certain state experienced by persons as they pass over the threshold from one stage of life to another. Uh, as an example, the rite of passage at puberty has three phases. Separation from one's status as a child, then a liminal stage, and finally reintegration into society as a full and independent member with rights and responsibilities that the uh, initiate did not have before. During the liminal stage, the in-between stage, one's status becomes ambiguous. One is neither here nor there. One is betwixt and between all fixed points of classification. Uh, this is discussed uh, quite widely in George Hansen's brilliant book, The Paranormal and the Trickster, uh, where he has noted the liminal nature of uh, most psi events, uh, ghosts, UFOs, and other types of paranormal occurrences. Ghosts are us, and they are not us. They are not really alive, nor are they really dead. When examining trends within haunting reports, it can be noted that they are often representative of places that could be considered liminal too. This includes specific locations within the haunted buildings, such as windows, doorways, staircases, and hallways where apparitions are more often than not reported. Time periods can also be considered in liminal states, and it would be of interest to see if this corresponds in a general time frame of lengthy hauntings like the Morton case that can be a century or more in duration, with groups of reported haunting experiences separated by decades or entire generations. Did each outbreak of haunting occur during a liminal time period? This line of inquiry could be expanded with an investigations of hauntings to include the experience or the witness. Are they in a liminal state as defined by their culture? An example of a liminal state in modern Western culture is divorce, and even more so marital separation. And another example may be graduate school an often protracted liminal state, as graduate students are not yet professionals, nor are they students. Yet, they are both. So who or what was the woman in black really? Let us now consider the Morton case, where the very first witness was a 19-year-old Rosina Clara Despard, living in Victorian England a period of well-defined gender roles. And she is studying to become a forensic doctor at the time of the ghost's first appearance. Witness Zero, which is what I will call her, begins experiencing an apparition of a woman in black in the house she shares with her parents and younger siblings. It is of interest here to note that in the Jungian analysis, the home or house is symbolic of the self or the psyche. Residents feature predominantly in cases of hauntings and people in general, when thinking of ghosts, may picture in their minds the classic image of a haunted house. Rosina not only could be seen as personally living in a liminal state at the time of her experience and during a liminal time period in general for women, the first women's suffrage movement in the United Kingdom was becoming a national movement around the time frame of these hauntings. I'm going to uh, read to you an excerpt from a paper examining the lives of women in the UK from 1905 to 1914, uh, which is very similar to that that was experienced by our witness. Ambitious, middle-class women faced enormous challenges and the goals of entering suitable careers such as nursing, teaching, law, and medicine. The loftier the ambition, the greater the challenge. Physicians kept tightly shut the door to medicine. 
there were a few places for women as lawyers, but none as clerics. And uh, this is from a book that I will I will actually put a link to uh, in the podcast in the description so that people can read a little bit more. It's from the uh, history of the English people. Life as a woman living in a large middle class family and training for a career in science during the Victorian times could not have been easy on Rosina by any stretch of the imagination. And it is a shame we have no personal accounts of her thoughts, feelings, and life in general beyond her ghostly experiences. If we examine the life of Witness Zero in this case, and in general the location and time frame that Rosina lived in, we can then begin to speculate a little bit more on the symbolism of the experience as a possible expression of Rosina herself. The apparition, viewed as a woman in black, so popularly thought to be the representation of a dead widow, can, in my opinion, be interpreted as symbolic of the social constraints on women of that era. The apparition then becomes a mirror of the first witness's life and the general circumstances of the location and the era in which she lived. The apparition could in fact be an outward subconscious projection of Rosina's own inner realm and psyche and that of a greater collective unconscious. It is further interesting to note that after the disbarred family moved, the haunting activity then became dormant until the late 1960s. And that reignites during another pivotal time in the women's rights movement, when the house was occupied by solely males and served as a diocesan house. Sai, as far as we understand, knows no constraints of space or time, and perhaps Rosina's haunting becomes reactivated during this highly charged time for women and the so-called sexual revolution. These ideas can be further explored within the case and the later hauntings, and I will write and discuss more in depth about that at a future time. The purpose of this recording is merely to give you, the listener, a taste at the potential insights that can emerge if we free ourselves from the constraint of the dead person hypothesis. Focusing on the witness and using some of these ideas and tools that will re-examine older cases and with well-established timelines and documentation and newer ones going forward could provide a much better framework, in my own personal opinion, for attempting to understand the true nature of these exceptional human experiences. Thank you for listening. Please check out my other recordings and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. You can also have a look through my virtual cupboard at susanstclair.com where there are far more goodies. More soonly. Thank you.